Bibles with you, perhaps you can turn with me uh, to the book of Joshua. Um, as we begin a new year, and we certainly in this church do not know what the new year holds, and as a family we do not, but we know that our God is a promise keeping God. And I wanted to briefly pause before jumping back into our study on the Ten Commandments and look at the place of promise, the promised inheritance, and look at an 85-year-old man called Caleb. And uh, if you know Joshua, Joshua 1 through 4 is about the Israelites crossing the Jordan. Joshua chapter 5 to chapter 12 is about conquering Canaan. And then Joshua 13 to the end of the book I'm not sure I'll get time to preach it in my time here, but it's about claiming the inheritance. It's about claiming the promised inheritance that is ours. So after reminding us that there's still so much land to possess, chapter 13, which begins the third section of the book of Joshua, starts out by surveying the land that had already been divided up as an inheritance for the two and a half tribes that had settled on the eastern shore of the Jordan. And this was the land of the Amorite kings, Sihan and Og, that the Israelites had conquered even before they crossed the Jordan and entered into the land of Canaan itself. And in chapter 14, just a bit of context, the assignment of new land as inheritance for the other nine and a half tribes. My maths is correct, two and a half plus nine and a half equals 12. Finally begins in earnest. So if you look at the passage before us in the moment in Joshua 14, the first five verses of Joshua 14 form an introductory um, introduction that will follow in the whole rest of the book of Joshua. So might be a good idea to read Joshua in the next coming weeks yourselves in your own private devotion with the Lord. And in the remainder of Joshua 14, the narrator zones in on this one individual, Caleb, and the inheritance that Caleb claims. By faith, he received what was promised. And you know something of the story of Caleb. Caleb, along with Joshua, was one of only two of all the spies that Moses had sent across the Jordan into Canaan 45 years earlier to investigate the land. And they came back with a positive report. I used to sing as a child, Caleb, a good report did bring. So Caleb brought this positive report and he urged Israel to invade and take possession of Canaan. The remaining spies, they were afraid of the Anakim, the mighty warriors who dwelt in the land. And in the event, the Israelites, they listened to the fearful spies and they didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. They disobeyed the Lord. They refused to cross the Jordan and they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So here we are, 45 years later, Joshua and Caleb are the only two who believed God's promise. The only two remaining from the original generation to have survived the wilderness wanderings. And here is Caleb, young or old, depending which way you look at it. He's 85 years old at this point. And he's determined to inherit the land that had been promised him. Caleb, 85 years old, determined to inherit the land that had been promised him. And before anyone else received their allotment, before a single plot of land is assigned to any of the tribes west of the Jordan, the narrator pauses on Caleb. Because Caleb is offered to us as an example of faith taking hold of the promised inheritance. Faith taking hold 
of the promised inheritance. This is an example, my friend, of faith taking hold of the promises of God. So Caleb has a lot to teach us. I'll consider the material in Joshua 14 in six, and I promise you very short sections, not with too many sub points either. And in the, in the first five verses, chapter 14, one to five, need to see what I'm going to just call an ordinary devotion. An ordinary devotion. Not an exciting bells and whistles, but ordinary devotion. And it emphasises the pattern of a careful, everyday obedience that is expected of God's people. Ordinary, normative, ordinary devotion to the Lord. And then in the main body of the chapter, after verse 5, we see, first of all, Caleb's boldness. We see his bold faith. He's a bold man. He stands four square on the words of Moses and he claims what is promised to him. So first of all, an ordinary, everyday devotion. But secondly, a bold faith. And in verses 8 and 9 and in 14, thirdly, we see Caleb's all-in, complete, utter commitment. It isn't that he just follows the Lord, he wholly follows the Lord. So Caleb models for us an ordinary devotion, a bold faith, but then an all-in, complete commitment. And then fourthly, I think we learn from Caleb, we see his sustained strength. Because it tells us he's 85 years old and the Lord has sustained him through all of these, these years. And he's still determined as ever to fight the Lord's battle. So we see an ordinary devotion, we see a bold faith, and we see this, um, also we see this complete and utter commitment. But then we see his sustained strength. And fifthly in verse 12, I think we see his eager expectation. He looks forward to the promise of driving out the Anakim with relish and eagerness. And finally, in 13 through 15, God gives him rest. The great gift of rest, renewing rest. So the outline is devotion, boldness, commitment, sustaining strength, an eager expectation, and then a rest. So let's pray before we read Joshua 14 together. But Lord God, your word speaks of the peace for those who love your word, and that nothing can make them stumble. stumble. We pray that you would work today by your word, awaken in us that love, and give us what you have promised, that peace and that rest. Holy Spirit, Give me the words that I may speak well of the Saviour, our Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. So Joshua 14, these are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, with their pasture lands, with their livestock and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses, they allotted the land. And in verse 6, the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Benar, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Benar to spy out the land. And I brought him word again, it's, it was in my heart, but my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. 
And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him and he gave Hebron to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for an inheritance. And therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kirith Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. Amen. We thank the Lord that he's spoken to us in the reading of his holy word. So first of all, look at, with me at verses 1 through 5, that kind of introductory section. And it's a prosaic introduction to the division of the land of Canaan through Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the various tribes of Israel. They cast lots, we're told, to determine who gets what. But twice, did you see it in verse 2 and in verse 5, we're told that the whole process was carried out just as the Lord commanded. Sometimes obedience is heroic. Sometimes obedience is costly. Sometimes obedience is inspiring, exemplary. But most of the time, most of the time, obedience is where no one else is looking. Most of the time, obedience is boring, ordinary, humdrum, and dreary. Following the Lord for most of the time is every day. Not when everyone can see you when you're putting on a show, but in your private following of the Lord your God who has saved you. So it's ordinary when no one's looking. There are no thrills in verses 1 through 5. There's no surprise. There's no strange twists of fate. They divided up the land. They cast lots. They did what God said they should do. Now maybe you do not think that is worth pointing out. But I think it's very worth pointing out. Because it's very helpful to note and to take lesson from ordinary devotion that's on display in the opening five verses. Mainly because verses 6 to 15 is very impressive. The record of the heroism and the boldness and the faith and the courage and the obedience of Caleb. By anyone's measure, Caleb is an extraordinary man. He's a remarkable man. He's an unusual man. And he has a great deal to teach us, as we will see in a few moments. But before we get to Caleb, we're in the lawyer's office. And we're just going through paperwork. And there's Eliezer and there's Joshua. And they're kind of doing what lawyers do. Figuring out who gets what in the land. And... I'm not saying that lawyers' work is dull and uninspiring. Apologies if that's coming across. That's not what I'm saying. But it's what the Lord commanded. It's what the Lord commanded. So here they are, burning the midnight oil in the office, filing deed after deed for parcels of land. But that is the measure of faithfulness. The one thing that the Lord has called us to do is to be faithful. 
When I'm asked questions, how would you do this? How would you do this? I was asked a question this week. Why would a Brit be interested in ministering in southern Mississippi? You know, um, why, you know, you know, what attraction is it? And at some point, you can't answer the question, but just say, the Lord calls us to be faithful. The Lord calls us to faithfulness. And the measure of faithfulness is not whether we will obey the commands of the Lord when the spotlight is on us and our service is dramatic and impactful and impressive. It is whether when no one notices, when doing the next thing that God calls us to do, even if it's run of the mill and there's no glamour, there's no payoff, there's no outward glory at all. Sure, sometimes God calls us to a public role. Maybe for someone here, there'll be a role where you're called to give public witness before many. Maybe we will be called on a TV camera to give an account of the faith that we have. Maybe we'll be called before a committee to say, why is prayer so very important? Sometimes he will call us to be faithful in the midst of major surgery. Maybe he will call someone here, maybe a younger person, to go on a mission trip to a difficult place. And there is grace and there is provision for that. But most of the time, he calls us to do a day's work. To come home, and yeah, wash the dishes, and yeah, to take out the bins, and yeah, to put food on the table, and yes, for men as well, husbands as well, to change the nappies, and balance the books, and pay the tax man. He calls us in 2024 to the same duties that he will call us to do again tomorrow. And they're the same tasks he called us to do last year. Because he's called us to faithfulness and Christian obedience. Sometimes it's extraordinary. You see a lot of extraordinary service in the book of Joshua. And as I said earlier, I really encourage you to read the book of Joshua as a result of the sermon today. And sometimes it is scary. Sometimes it is challenging. Sometimes it's way outside our comfort zones. But mainly Christian obedience is ordinary. And every day, when no one's looking, and we give ourselves to do it because that's what God tells us to do. That's what God tells us to do. And it's faithfulness. And it's a vital lesson that we all must learn. You won't be blessed in that sense in the outward up front if you're not faithful in the everyday one foot before the next obedience of the Christian life. So secondly though we see his bold faith with that necessary emphasis in place with having burnt the midnight oil in the, in the lawyer's office. We're ready to look at Caleb's testimony which begins in verse 6. So first of all, the, the, the Lord calls us to an ordinary devotion, but then we learn from Caleb, he has a bold faith. So the people of Judah show up at City Hall in Gilgal to receive their allotment, and Caleb is first forward to press his claim. You see that in verse 6. Caleb, the son of Jephun, Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me. He goes on to tell us exactly what Moses said, or what, more importantly, what the Lord said to Moses in verse 9. Surely the land on which your foot is trodden shall be an inheritance to you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And then in verse 10, Caleb highlights how the Lord kept his promises to him and spoke these promises about Caleb's inheritance to Moses. It's not just Moses' promise, it is God's word. And having reminded Joshua of his claim in verse 12, 
Caleb, rather bluntly, presses home the point. Verse 12, so now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. This is faith at work. It's faith at work. Think about it. It's 45 years since God made promise through Moses to Caleb to give him the land. And everybody Caleb grew up with, with the exception of Joshua, is dead. And he's 85 years old, 85 years old, and he's not done with standing on the promises of God. He's not done with standing on the promises. He will not quit until God fulfills what he had said. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. You can Google this name if you like, but in 1969, a lawyer in Arizona called Russell T. Tanzi, it's under Wikipedia against the suing God, if you wanted to look at it, suing God. But Russell T. Tanzi filed a suit in law against God on behalf of his secretary, Betty Penrose, seeking $100,000 from God. Because Penrose claimed that God was at fault for allowing a lightning bolt to strike her home. Now, I know that's America where they do a fair bit of litigation, but even so, I wasn't quite sure how they could expect God to write them a cheque, but any, you know, whatever it may be. So the lawsuit was, was placed under the argument that God owned the property because a singer had transferred the deed upon his death to God. So the deed was ruled invalid due to God not being able to take possession of the property. It's silly, it's blasphemous, but there's a little kernel, there's a little thing there of something that's important in Mr. Tanzi's lawsuit because Caleb understood as he stood on the uh, courthouse steps in Gilgal, he was suing for the fulfilment of the promise that God had made to him. Now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke that day. And that's the boldness, that's the boldness, if you like, the feistiness of the faith that stands on God's promise and says, Lord, you promised you would give me the land. You promised you would give me. Now give me. Do you ever talk like that to God? You promised. You promised. Would you keep your words? The Puritan, John Preston, said, you may sue God of his bond written and sealed. He cannot deny it. Take no denial, though the Lord may defer, he will do it, for that is part of his covenant. At the outset of the year, we trust that the Lord will give what he has promised. And we see that through scriptures. And above all, that assures us of our coming inheritance of the promised land. Eternal life. Forgiveness of sin. Glory. Bold faith is what we need. A bold faith. It is not enough to wait on God to keep his promise, wondering when and if he might follow through with his words. We need to press our claim and we need to pray like that. Wed your petition to the promise and then press him to keep his words. You find it all throughout Scripture of the heroes of the faith who press in on God for the fulfilment of his promise. It's bold, it's feisty, and it's something that we badly need. Yes, we need ordinary devotion, but we don't just wait, just wait helplessly. No, we press in with boldness. And so we have an ordinary devotion, we have a bold faith. And then thirdly, we have complete and utter commitment it isn't just that God, Caleb believes that God is good for his words. It is believing that God is good for his words. And he's prepared to devote himself entirely to life on God's terms. 
It's a complete all-in commitment. His life is given up. His life is abandoned to following the Lord. How many of us can say that, that our life is given up to complete commitment to the things of the Lord? Or is it given up to complete commitment to the worship of self? Caleb, in verses 7 and 8, remembers about going as a spy all those years ago. And then he says, I brought him word again as it was on my heart. My brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And that language is repeated throughout the chapter. I wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10 and again in verse 14. So clearly this passage, even at a very brief reading, emphasises this point. Caleb is an example of faith that leads to action. God promised to give them the land. Caleb took God at his word and he lived in light of that promise, living accordingly. Bold faith that pleads the promises of God follows through with a complete commitment to life on his terms. It follows through. So it's not enough just to be bold in faith and say, Lord, give me. You then follow through with a life lived with complete commitment to the things of the Lord. It doesn't ask God to act and then refuse to obey. It presses in, but then lives a life of complete obedience and commitment. Have you ever wondered why God has not answered your prayers? Or could it be that you've been looking to him to keep his promises to you, but you've been refusing to fulfil your duty to him? It's not, it's not a, in that sense, it's amazing, it is grace, undeserved grace. But there's a wholeheartedness to which we're called from, called to, that I found very challenging in Caleb's life. Caleb doesn't claim to be perfect, but he is saying that he's committed to living life on the basis of the utter reliability of the word and the promise of God. So we need to ask ourselves, well, what about me? What about me? It's not enough to make excuses. Am I a Christian with exceptions? Am I a, a Christian? And you know, James Devon is a Christian, and then you have a little asterisk, and then if you look at the asterisk, with the following caveats. Is there any small print when it says, I'm a Christian? You follow Jesus most of the way, but not all the way because of this. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Caleb was all in. The Lord is calling us to be all in for him. So ordinary devotion, a bold and a feisty faith, a complete commitment, and fourthly, Look at his sustained strength in verses 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel was in the wilderness. And behold, I am this day 85 years old. I don't know if it's his birthday, but he's as strong at 85 as he was on the day Moses sent him for war and for coming and going. He's 85. Um, senior saints, take note, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God. There's no retirement. I was asked, do you plan to retire? I said, no, I would plan to die with my boots on. But there's no retirement in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The Lord calls you to serve him till you cross the finish line. The Lord calls you to serve until you cross the finish line and you may not stop until that day. Caleb is 85 and he presses on. Now granted now, Caleb is given testimony to the supernatural strength of God equipping him so that he's ready to march into battle at 85 as strong as he was at 40. Now it's a unique 
thing in the history of salvation, but we need to notice there are many promises of sustained strength that are spoken to you and to me. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Psalm 84, verse 5 and 7. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. They go from strength to strength. God loves to keep that promise. 1 Timothy 1, verse 2. Paul thanks God who's given me strength. 1 Peter 4, 11. Peter calls those who serve to serve in the strength that God supplies. Paul prays in Ephesians 3, verse 16, that God may strengthen us with power through his Spirit in our inner being. Strength is a gift of grace for all believers, not just for Caleb, to sustain us under trials, to uphold us in the long path of faithfulness until we cross the finish line. Persevering grace, strength to keep going. You feel weak, you feel like me, you feel weak, you're struggling, can I keep going? Life is hard, you get weary, you get wounded. There are supplies of strength, but they're not to be found, as the world would tell you, in some deep, mysterious, some kind of esoteric, untapped reservoir within yourself. I was appalled to find a Christian writer wrote a book this week. I saw it in a bookstore. It said, 15 ways so you can live longer from, <laughs> from somebody who thinks he's a Christian. And, you know, 15 or 7 ways to change your life. I mean, he should make, he'd make a lot of money if he found a diet that did that. But they're not to be found in some deep, untapped reservoir within yourself. You'll never find them in yourself. Never. You find them in God alone who promises to give strength to his children. And a word of warning about how that is going to go in the interest of establishing reasonable expectations. Fresh supplies of strength will likely, not likely come to you in times of weariness and need. In some kind of dramatic infusion for people who watch Marvel films like Dr. Robert Bruce Banner turning into the Incredible Hulk all of a sudden. You have something weak and puny and suddenly, you know, with great big green muscles. No, that's not how it will be. That's not how it will be. One day, one day you find yourself on the far side of a terrible season of trial that drove you to your knees. And you'll find yourself, and I've proved this and I know it's true, you'll find yourself on the other side of the trial and you'll wonder, how on earth did I ever get here? How did I get here? And you realise that he gave you strength to get there. That's how, it, that that's how it will go. You'll find yourself on the other side of a trial and you'll wonder, how did I get here? And you realise that he brought you through. He brought you through the fire. He brought you through the floods. It wasn't some inner reservoir that you had. He alone brought you through. You didn't see it at the time. You didn't realise it at the time. But looking back, you made it through. Because the Lord God sustained you. In his strength and in his grace. He brought you through. He persevered. He kept you. So you keep on going. You do the next thing. And you persevere. And you say with wonder and with gratitude with Paul, now, now, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in every and any circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How did I make it? I wasn't strong, but Jesus Christ is my strength and my shield, my rock and my deliverer. He led me through and his strength is made perfect in my weakness. His sufficiency 
is more than a match for my need. Will you remember that? That his sufficiency is more than a match for my need. There is strength for you in him. So ordinary devotion, Caleb teaches us, a bold faith, a complete commitment, a sustained strength. And then fifthly, look at verse 12 and see his eager expectation. So now give me this hill country which the Lord spoke on that day. For you've heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. I love verse 12. Here's 85-year-old Caleb spoiling for a fight with as much eagerness as he did when he was 40. I mean, I, you know, I mean, the times when I'm just tired and I say, well, I can't do what I did when I was back then. I can't even do what I did when I was 55, let alone when I was 40. I can't even remember what it was like. But when he came back from his scouting mission across the Jordan when he was 40, he brings up the Anakim, who were the big brutes. They were the big bruisers that the Israelites were so scared of. Who knows? Maybe I'll be the one, 85-year-old Caleb, that the Lord will use to drive out the baddies. And by the way, he says, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. Caleb is not saying, I am not sure if God can keep his word. He's saying, I'm not sure that I will be the instrument, but whatever happens, the Lord will keep his word. May it be that I am the instrument by which the Lord will achieve that. So there's an eager expectation. God will do it either way. With me or without me, but I sure would be like to be the one. But I sure would like to know which way it will go. He's a willing instrument in the hands of God, eager to trust him and to take him at his word and to claim his promises. Caleb rebukes my pessimism a lot. Or at least this passage disciplines and directs that pessimism in a godly way. Because I think Caleb is saying, I'm sceptical about myself. I can't remember who it was. Was it Churchill said about Attlee when we're told that Mr Attlee is a very modest man? He says, well, he's a lot to be modest about. You know what I mean? So um, <laughs> I think that's what he said. And if he didn't, he jolly well should have done. But, I mean, you know, I, it's right that I should be pessimistic about myself. I sure cannot defeat the Anakim. But be remarkably optimistic about the promise of God. You can be rightly sceptical about yourself, but be very optimistic about God's promise. Be very optimistic about the advance of the kingdom of God to God's fulfilment of what he said he would do. If you look at yourself in the light of Holy Scripture, be dreadfully pessimistic about yourself with your dreadfully deceitful heart, prone to wander and leave the God that you love. But look at Jesus Christ. Look away from self to Jesus Christ, who obeyed and bled and died and rose and reigns and is coming again. Look at the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb who was slain, who comes to the one who's seated on heaven's throne and he takes the scroll and he opens its seals. He alone brings to pass the promises of God. He alone brings God's purposes to pass. His kingdom shall rule from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. And then, and there, we have every reason to be confident and optimistic, not about everything in life, but about the fulfilment of the plan and the promise of God. <laughs> Caleb would have understood William Carey's sentiments when Carey said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. That's the atmosphere of verse 12, eager expectation, Pessimism about himself. I'm not sure I will be the one to drive out the Anakim. But optimism, certainty about the promises of God. Remember, he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. So my closing point, 
He's, there's an ordinary devotion that the Lord calls us to when no one's looking in 2024, an ordinary devotion. There's a bold faith that we must seize hold of. There's complete commitment to live in life as a follower of Jesus. There's a sustained strength that he will give his children. There's an eager expectation, a pessimism about yourself for sure, but an, there's an eager expectation of what God will do. And finally, there's renewing rest. The promise of God is renewing rest. I say renewing rest because of verse 15. Caleb receives Hebron as part of his inheritance, and the verse says, now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriatha Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. There's a victory in the change of the name. Caleb's humble yet venturesome risk-taking faith. They expected great things from God, and so he attempted great things for God. In, actually, in the issue, does become the instrument that the Lord uses to drive out the Anakim. Arba, he's the greatest of the Canaanite goons among the Anakim. He's toppled from power, and the city that was named for him gets a new name. Remember that, that Kiriath Arba is now named Hebron. And that becomes a pattern in God's dealings with us. Because whenever his kingdom breaks in, there is a new name. Listen to Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until a righteousness goes forth as brightness, and a salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You will no longer be termed forsaken, your land will no longer be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her and your land married, for the Lord delights in you and your land will be married. So Revelation 2 verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and I'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. A new name, it points to a new self, a new you, renewal, transformation. God makes you new when he breaks into your heart and into your life. That's what God's kingdom does. And as a result, verse 15 says there is rest. Jesus promises us rest. That's what the gospel gives you. You can lay your deadly doing down. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Renewing rest is what Caleb brought to Hebron. Renewing rest is what Jesus died to bring to your heart. May, are you restless? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? And all too often that is me. Restless, weary, distracted, heavy laden. There is a new name. There is a new self. There is a new you that brings rest. And it's only and always in Jesus Christ. You see, Joshua 14 points us not to Caleb's example, not to 85-year-old Caleb, but it points us to the Lord Jesus. It points us to the gospel, to the Lord Jesus who alone will give us rest and he makes all things new. A wonderful saviour is Jesus Christ my Lord. He hideth my soul. He gives me rest. He makes all things new. Whatever lessons Caleb can teach us about the life of faith, we will never learn them apart from the new life that Jesus gives and the rest that he provides.
So get yourself this morning to Jesus Christ. Maybe for the first time. Maybe for the hundredth time. Maybe for the millionth time. But rest in Him. Rest on His obedience. Rest on His body that was broken for us. Rest on His blood that was shed for us. And let Joshua 14 teach you about what it means to live the life of faith following Jesus in ordinary devotion, in boldness of faith, with complete commitment, trust in him for sustained strength, looking forward with eager expectation. And may the Lord bless you and give you rest. For his name's sake. Amen.